If you could each take two, min two minutes or less to answer this question, how, how do we align industry needs with higher education outcomes? I can start with that one. <laughs> well, I, I, I mentioned in my first uh, comments that I feel one of the uh, necessary uh, components of that matching of higher ed offerings to, to employer needs is a much more effective level of engagement between the employer community and, and, and higher ed. Uh, you know, it's, it's a very common uh, narrative these days to hear that, well, higher ed is not producing the kinds of skills that the workforce needs. And as evidence of that, uh, well, you know, employers have posted a position on an electronic job bank and they didn't get any qualified candidates. Ergo, there no, must not be any. So I mentioned those job banks as being one of the potential sources of that. But, uh, you know, when you look at the, the um, frequency with which you hear this narrative in the context of the economy over the last few years, uh, high unemployment, including unemployment of uh, well-educated individuals. And I think more significantly, the level of underemployment. The American Community Survey data suggests that 50% of our Minnesota workforce is working in jobs for which they're over-educated. Uh, 50%, uh, you know, it's, it's like 1.2 million out of 2.4 million uh, workers in our economy are working in jobs that don't require the level of education uh, that, that those jobs uh, typically need. Uh, that's a terrible misallocation of resources, both from a society perspective, but certainly from an individual's perspective, considering tuition rates and, and student debt. And uh, so you, that, that, within that perspective, it, it, it didn't make sense to me, and it didn't make sense to a lot of other people that are a lot smarter than me, that there should be this attractive narrative, a, a narrative that is attractive to many, uh, that says that, well, we're, ju we're just not skilled enough. We just don't have enough educated individuals coming out of colleges. Um, and, and so we started following up with companies that uh, revealed to us in the conduct of a, of a job vacancy survey that we conduct every six months. They were looking for uh, people in particular uh, areas. Uh, we we kind of cherry picked areas that we heard most frequently being cited as areas of, of skill shortages, areas like IT and nursing and, and production occupations like CNC programmers and machinists. And we followed up with these companies to really explore the nature of their difficulty. And, and as we started asking these people, uh, these employers, uh, about what they were doing to attract qualified candidates, uh, we found quite frequently that they weren't, they weren't conducting very effective candidate searches. Uh, we had one, in, one company that uh, said, yeah, we just can't find anybody. Well, what do you do? How are you searching for candidates? Oh, by word of mouth or running an ad in the, in the local newspaper, uh, things like that. A, a lot of them just weren't aware of the existence of these electronic job banks. Many of them recognized through the course of our interview with them that their wages weren't competitive. And on top of that, well, we're only interested in hiring people that currently have a job. So, you know, you've, you've got a situation in which I'm, I want to hire somebody, they have to have a job, presumably paying a market wage, but our wages are, we acknowledge, not competitive. Uh, increasingly, we have seen employers uh, requiring experience that is, is very difficult to, to come by. One of the most interesting was, uh, uh, three years after .NET came out in 2008, a company posting a, uh, a job that required five years of .NET programming. 
Uh, I saw an ad on, online that was uh, cu cut out of a newspaper uh, for a job at McDonald's, a line worker at McDonald's, and it said college degree required. Uh, you know, a lot of this is being driven by the fact that employers feel they can do this, that market conditions are such that they can afford to be picky, uh, but then, you know, they're, they're finding difficulty attracting anybody, uh, considering the experience, the, the, the need for current employment, uh, the wages they're offering, and, and so on. So, um, I, I think that, that engagement between the, the educational community, not just the educational community, but the public sector, uh, government as a whole, uh, and, and the employer community needs to be raised to a level where there's a much better understanding of what is required for the jobs and, and what is required of those jobs to attract the qualified candidates. And, and there's too many crazy examples of there just being such a, 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 a miscommunication between these two players in this job matching mechanism here uh, that, that needs to be corrected. Okay, just real quick here. I, I think what I would say is that um, we were given some questions to reflect on for today, as you can kind of tell. and. I'm only throw, putting this out here because of some questions that we also didn't receive. In this question about aligning industry needs with higher education outcomes, because Steve spoke so eloquently about that, I'm going to just pose another question of let's also, at the same time as we're talking about aligning higher education outcomes with industry, let's also talk about aligning higher education experiences and outcomes with community needs with social organizations, with our larger society and our goals that we have as a collective. Because there has been a huge shift. I've been working in higher education for more than 20 years now. There's been a huge shift in the way we talk about ourselves. In that, yes, we've always been about workforce preparation, but now it feels like that's the first thing that we're about. It didn't always used to be this way. It didn't always used to be that we always prioritize business and industry in the ways in which we thought about ourselves. Extremely important, I don't mean to minimize it, but there are other ways of thinking about what we're here to do too. And I think AACNU's done some really nice research that, that focuses around uh, the employer requirements that aren't those technical skills that likely aren't going to show up or they're always kind of uh, the, the motherhood and apple pie kind of requests that, that make a fundamental difference in the effectiveness of an employee and an individual's ability to navigate a changing job market. Things like communication skills and teamwork skills, the ability to synthesize and prioritize, the, you know, the, these things that are really at the core of, of a liberal education. And so as we start to think about what our educational system needs to deliver to have a healthy, agile workforce, so much of it comes down to creating learners, creating thinkers, creating proactive problem solvers. And how can we, how can we layer that kind of conversation on top of the technical skill requirements so that we can not only get into the job, but as the whole market and economy changes around us and as society changes around us, we can adjust and evolve with it. Cool. Um, I'm gonna contrast maybe slightly with Steve, um, because I think there's a paradox here. I mean, it seems to me that we recognize that we're failing to produce graduates that meet current and future workforce needs. But at the same time, we've bought into this thing of industrial consumerism and it seems to have colonized humanism and politics, and I would also say it's also colonized higher education. It's also Columbus Day, so it's a nice day to reflect on colonization, I guess. <laughs> um, but I think that what Steve was talking about, you know, how you find employers, how you find the jobs, that's just fine. But I think that given this culture, that for individuals, that many of the talents that we align with entrepreneurship are perhaps our best hopes for guaranteeing participation and expression in this emerging reality. And for this, we really need to focus on the development of soft skills, which also include um, you know, entrepreneurship, critical thinking, searching, synthesizing, et cetera. And it's at this point, I need a break from script and ask, where's Gardner Lepp? I'm up in Duluth. Oh, you're in Duluth, hi. Gardner, you, you, you're, t because I was rudely tweeting, as Rebecca would, would probably uh, note, but you had a very nice tweet. Can you, can you read your tweet for us? 
Sure. I just said, uh, ugh, this is getting depressing. What's going right with higher ed? Yeah, which I, which I think is great, because there's a lot of great stuff happening with higher education. And, um, and a lot of it's not really the $180 textbooks, although maybe you're referring to Peter Gray's introduction. Is that, is that it? There are a number of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, Peter and I are working on this question. So he just wrote a book, um, uh, I think it's called Free to, Freedom to Learn or Freedom to Play. Um, I'm bad with t names of people and titles of books. Um, but we're collaborating on creating a school in Munich that is really focused on the soft skill development, entrepreneurship development, um, in addition to you know, also carrying these ideas over to higher education with the, the NOMADS initiative as well. And this is where we really focus on critical thinking, problem solving skills, searching and synthesizing, creativity and innovation skills, collaboration skills, contextual learning, um, self-direction, and really building the ability to learn, unlearn, relearn, uh, or recontextualize what we know into, into uh, to solving new questions, new problems. And so that's how I kind of contrast slightly with Steve. Can I rebut? Yes. <laughs> Well, I, I, you have to be positive about it. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. I, actually, I want, I want to clarify because I, uh, I, I'm, I'm not meaning to suggest that there um, needs to be a more sort of vocational focus in, in higher ed, uh, but rather that uh, the, like the, the job bank matching mechanisms, one of the reasons that I think there's been such a focus on those vocational types of trainings is that the degree that you get is a, is a good matching mechanism in those algorithms. So if you've got a degree in Soviet studies, you know, that's not going to match well with a lot of those other electronic <laughs> job postings out there that are, that are looking uh, for workers. Um, you know, so how, how do we develop a matching mechanism that recognizes the, the broader skill sets that people of different types of programs come to the workforce with, you know, when all this matching algorithm is going to look at is what's your major study? Uh, you know, that's part of the... the, <laughs> the the downside of this technological advancement is that it doesn't give us the 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 color of an individual's ex, you know educational experience that they come out of college with uh, that are very very important to a successful um, uh, you know career. Um, and, and the other aspect is that the the employers again whether they feel that they're able to now or, or what have you. Expecting experience in very firm specific skill areas uh, rather than relying on on-the-job training, you know, and, it, and this can be applied to everything from, you know, the, the vocational types of apprentice, apprenticeable occupations to um, you know, higher level uh, uh, careers or careers involving a higher level of education. Uh, but this expectation that employers frequently have uh, that their successful hire is going to be somebody that can come in the door on day one and do exactly what they are expected to do without any sort of uh, preparation on the part of that employer is, is something that the scarce evidence suggests has dropped off to essentially nothing, all right? The expectation is that higher ed will provide those skills necessary for fully profitable employment on day one. And that, that's never been the case until the last few years. Uh, and we need to get back to that, um, I think that kind of situation where somebody with a degree in Soviet studies can come in and do a very, very good job uh, you know, perhaps with a little background on how you run this machine or, or, or whatever it is that the job requires. I don't need to think on Soviet studies, but... <laughs> there's, there's a lot of material there. <laughs> okay, well, I want to thank our panelists for the lively discussion. Um, this isn't, 
your last chance to speak though, because um, what we want you to do is sit down at a table um, that has an open spot. And then for folks that maybe are sitting at tables that aren't, that, that are more sparse, if you could move to a table to fill in that's um, not full. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Kevin Lang, who is part of our GAPSA board and is a student representative to the Board of Regents. So thank you, Kevin.